On May the 10th, 1940, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain. He couldn't have picked a worse day. That was the day Hitler chose to launch his blitzkrieg against France and Britain. At dawn, a whole German airborne division parachuted into Holland to seize bridges and airfields. Simultaneously, the massive Belgian fortress of Eban Emal was assaulted. Paratroop engineers were dropped on top by swooping German gliders. They swiftly silenced its guns. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe attacked Dutch and Belgian air bases. Then the frontier barriers were pushed aside. And Hitler's Army Group B, under General Fedor von Bock, now drove into Holland and Belgium. As planned, the French and British armies along the Belgian border moved forward to their new defensive line along the Dial and Meuse rivers. But none of the Allied commanders seemed to have noticed that German Army Group A, which had the bulk of the panzers, after brushing aside the Belgian frontier troops, had now begun driving through the hills and woods of the Ardennes to their south. Meanwhile, the Germans were pushing rapidly through Holland. The obsolete Dutch army was no match for the highly tuned German war machine. And it was under continual heavy air attack by the Luftwaffe, which roamed the skies unchallenged. On May the 14th, the Germans demanded the surrender of the port of Rotterdam. A large force of bombers took off as the Dutch hesitated. While they were airborne, the Dutch agreed to surrender the city, but apparently a recall message never reached the bombers. Rotterdam was devastated. The Dutch capitulated the next day. Then came the hammer blow. The thing that British and French planners had thought impossible had happened. German panzers were through the Ardennes and had reached the Meuse by the evening of May the 12th. Among the first to arrive at Sedan, well north of the Maginot Line, were the men of the 19th Panzer Corps, commanded by General Heinz Guderian, fresh from the triumphs in Poland. Guderian now showed how Blitzkrieg should be done. He ignored the troops in the Maginot line, and he didn't wait for his own infantry to catch up. He pushed straight on. The next day, assault troops crossed the River Meuse. Engineers began building bridges for the armor while under heavy French fire. On the 14th, the panzers began crossing. That evening, Guderian's bridgehead was eight miles deep. The French troops, stuck in the Maginot line, were too immobile to intervene. Allied bombers made despairing attempts to destroy the German bridges. But most were shot down. All the while, German artillery pounded the French defences while the Stuckers screamed in. Just three days after the attack had been launched, the French defenders around Sedan broke. Guderian's panzers began racing westwards. By nightfall, they had advanced more than 40 miles behind a northern group of Allied armies. 
These had been holding firm on the dial line, but now the French Supreme Commander, General Gamelin, realized that they were about to be encircled. He ordered them to fall back. This sudden decision to withdraw bewildered the Allied troops, who had no idea what was going on behind them. As they fell back, they were hindered by a growing flood of refugees clogging the roads. That day, the French Prime Minister, Paul Reynaud, phoned Churchill. He said, we are beaten, we have lost the battle. But for all the brilliance of the Blitzkrieg, the Germans were vulnerable. As the panzers raced westwards, they created an ever longer corridor just a few miles wide. The Allies realized that this was open to counterattack. The bulk of the German army was still totally dependent on horsepower or its own feet for transport. So the gap between the rampaging panzers and the follow-up infantry grew with every hour. On May the 17th, Colonel Charles de Gaulle, commander of one of the newly formed French armor divisions, made the first of two attempts to cut through the German line near Crécy. But the cumbersome French command system meant that units were sent into battle piecemeal, not in a coordinated thrust. The Germans had little difficulty warding off both attacks, inflicting heavy casualties. It seemed that nothing could now stop Guderian. He plunged on further and further into France. By the 19th, his lead units were past Perron. On the 20th, in an extraordinary 56-mile dash, Amiens had been taken by lunchtime. Abbeville, just 14 miles from the English Channel, was seized by nine that evening. And at midnight, a battalion of the 2nd Panzer Division reached the coast at Noyelle. The Germans had split the Allied front in two. Everything now depended on whether they could defend this long, thin corridor or whether the Allies could successfully counterattack. So now the British got ready to break the German lines. On May the 21st, two armoured battalions prepared to launch an attack south of Arras. The British tanks were even more unsuited to fast-moving armoured warfare than the French. Their most effective machine, the Matilda II, had been designed for infantry support. Though well armoured, it was slow and undergunned. The Germans had little trouble in repulsing the attack. But it did have an effect. By now, the German high command were becoming worried by their extended lines of communication. So, for the time being, driving south into the rest of France was put on hold until the infantry had caught up. The priority was to turn north and eliminate the British expeditionary force and the French first army fighting beside it. On May the 22nd, Guderian and the Panzers began their attack to destroy the Allied armies. These were now pulling back to the ports of Boulogne, Calais and Dunkirk, but they were trapped. On May the 23rd, General Alan Brooke, commander of British II Corps, wrote, Nothing but a miracle can save the British expeditionary force. Two days later, the Germans seized Boulogne. It was beginning to look as if even a miracle would be too late.